Okay, hello everybody. I am here on behalf of Vistio London. Um, unfortunately, due to illness and absence, I am the only person who's managed to make it. Uh, that means that you have the um, intense disappointment of hearing me deliver two consecutive talks, for which I apologise profusely and will attempt to avoid uh, excess verbosity. Um, so we'll start off with uh, Kubernetes in general and look at some security issues and some of the things that have affected Kubernetes since day one. Then I will go into uh, Matt Turner's Life of Packet talk. Uh, so Matt is a founding engineer at Tetrate, which is basically uh, a lot of the Istio team um, who built Istio originally and, uh, and some other guys um, based out of San Francisco. Uh, and his talk goes into detail on uh, the networking and the traversal of that packet through the mesh, what a mesh actually means, um, and goes into some, yeah, some depth there. And then uh, I'll hand over to Control Plane's Head of Security, Rowan Baker, and uh, Rowan will go through um, security rationale for Istio. So uh, what Istio is good at, what it's bad at, and some uh, glaring emissions that are still yet to be addressed, and just looking at how that um, can fit into the deployment. So, uh, with that in mind, how many people here are familiar with Kubernetes? That is excellent. Right. Uh, well, that means that this first bit of the talk will not be, uh, not be too difficult. I will not belabor stuff. Uh, we'll just go over Kubernetes security. This is uh, a partially kind of abridged version of um, what is often a sort of our diatribe at security versus features. The much longer slides are available online, so um, yeah, this is, as I say, the abridged version. And without further ado, let's see if this all works. Wonderful. Right. So, hi, I'm Andy. Um, a little bit of all the three buzzwords, of course. Uh, you can say I'm a build fanatic and an advocate of continuous everything. I'm a co-founder of Control Plane, which is security engineering for cloud native infrastructure and applications. And we're going to talk about Kubernetes. So, first of all, what's gone wrong? Back in the day, the Kubelet was by default insecure. And it can be alleged that Kubernetes in general still has that particular problem. Um, the nature of this was such that uh, one could actually attack this local port, 10250, and this guy basically disclosed it, but pace of feature delivery fails to keep up with security, as I'm sure we all know day to day and in all the projects that we see. Arguably, this is a good thing for Kubernetes because it is the preeminent orchestrator by quite some distance. It has eaten the world despite all these problems. Uh, so the first real problem was that there was no role-based access control. We had attribute-based access control and it wasn't very good. In addition, because of... <coughs> speak up, right. Uh, in addition, because of... Uh, the way the Borg was orchestrated, which was the Google internal project um, to which, uh, which was a precursor to the Kubernetes, um, all Borg um, pods essentially have service accounts, and those service accounts delegate responsibility and privilege to perform other actions against the infrastructure. As such, by default, Kubernetes loads a service account into every single pod. Up until uh, 1.6, that service account was God mode. Cluster admin and a remote code execution in a, a web-facing application would root the whole cluster. That is still a problem if your RBAC rules are misconfigured. Uh, there was no SecCom, there was no app armor. This from Kubecon Berlin was the launch talk for SecCom from Jesse Frizzell, who else, who also shipped all the SecCom functionality into Docker, which I kind of just wiring up things in the kernel, but she did a huge amount of acceptance testing on the existing Docker containers. This was an incredible talk by Brad Giesemann, who has now been snapped up by Google, it's no longer Symantec, and he took the cluster stand-up and provisioning mechanisms available at the time, he wrote uh, a harness to spin them up, and he attacked them all, responsibly disclosed all of the problems, and then we had this talk uh, at KubeCon, which is, is really fantastic, I would recommend it strongly. Helm, which was used to deploy applications um, almost by default in many clusters for the first few years of Kubernetes, has security issues. 
TLS configuration only landed in 2.3 and was broken from other four minor versions. The uh, default installation is not secure and it opens a gRPC interface. So again, you get an RCE into a cluster and you can make an outbound, um, uh, what did I just say? Uh, the Google RPC, gRPC uh, call to Tiller, which is the in-cluster deployment component you can deploy whatever you like without authentication. So again, this has to be locked down in the cluster. Uh, this was fun. Uh, Tesla, who make uh, autonomous weapons, <laughs> <laughs> left one of their clusters open, but they didn't actually leave it open. Rather, they made sure you could access dashboard, which is running on a essentially a loopback adapter, contained within a pod, not exposed to the internet. Somehow they wired the socket through from the internet, so you could access the dashboard. <coughs> Again, the dashboard has a history of default insecurity. And initially, access to the dashboard gave you access to an RVAC role that would allow you to deploy whatever you want. If you then go on to deploy, for example, a privileged container which fires a reverse shell back to somewhere that you control, you can root the cluster in a couple of simple steps. Uh, so, of course, this is, this is quite easy to do because Kubernetes is, like all open source software, has failed to really clarify its security boundaries and its, uh, its security problems until people make clamor about them and they get sort of publicly disclosed. Uh, then we had subpath volume traversal problems. This essentially said that if I start a container and I write a symlink to it, if I have a second container in this flow, all in the same pod, when the second container resolves the symlink, it resolves locally on the host machine and not in the mount namespace that it should resolve into, which means if you set an absolute symlink from the root of your drive to something useful, uh, maybe you want to put it into system D and you want to start your own unit, uh, then you can again really quite easily uh, break the cluster. This is because what we're trying to do with containers in general, and Kubernetes in particular, is isolate with namespaces and every time we disable any namespace or essentially share it with the host, so turning it off, uh, we dramatically increase the risk of uh, a breakout of that pod. So running privileged pods, it's a no-no, you can get out of those very easily. Running pods that mount um, things from the host, again, problematic, um, especially if you're sharing those with other processes. Uh, if you share your network adapter with the host, then you can potentially loop back to anything running on local host on your host machine. You can potentially put that adapter into promiscuous mode and sniff traffic for other pods. So there should be minimal namespace sharing across the cluster, full stop, triple golden factors, no returns. And finally, recently, uh, CD 9.8, I think, critical, probably the worst thing uh, that could happen. A bug that had existed for at least two or three years in uh, HTTP handling code, specifically web socket code, um, didn't terminate the connection properly. And because of the nature of, sort of reproxying uh, by virtue of the API extension mechanism that Kubernetes confusingly but in some way usually builds out, um, one was able to make requests as an unauthorized user as the API server itself, which is cluster admin. Um, that bit of code has probably been copied hundreds of times from the Kubernetes project because we would consider it canonical. Imagine that that was the uh, best way to do it. It kind of, we, we get back into conversations with Linus's law, <coughs> thousands of eyes, or many eyes problem. And there will continue to be problems like this with Kubernetes for sure. Container storage interface was introduced relatively recently in development terms. Bound to be full of bugs, storage interface is horrible. Um, so yeah, if, uh, as far as I know, the project is not being fuzzed right now. So if anyone has access to a whole amount of computes, that would be where I would be looking. So uh, broadly, is this cluster secure? Moss does not think so. Thanks, Moss. OK, so uh, the control plane. We'll look at this quickly and then look at some layers of security and um, try not to go on too long. This is a great diagram from Lucas Kaldstrom, which also shows protocols we've got traveling across the wire or locally here. Um, of course, the uh, 
the CNI plugin here, which is uh, CNI here, but actually what this networking does is source complexity. It's somewhere that we need to have things like network policies enabled. And um, if we defer, uh, some network security features are dependent upon the plugin that we choose there. So um, we'll get into that later. And of course, this would normally be running in a highly available scenario with multiple SCD instances, multiple API servers because they're uh, uh, essentially stateless. Um, we'll be stateless with SCD. Uh, <coughs> I will just move on from there without getting into too much detail. Minimum viable security is TNS everywhere, as we know. This is for the control plane. For applications, this is more difficult because. As we know, no one likes running PKI, certificate rotation, when done manually is always a sort of problem and potentially expiry. This is where we'll get on sort of the magic Vistio and rationalizing why the application layer this makes sense. Um, I will keep on whipping through these quite quickly. There is a mechanism for bootstrapping extra nodes into cluster. It should be noted that by default, most places will just auto sign the CSR. So that assumes a trust boundary that allows you to auto scale, but also means a malicious user can um, sign their own CSRs, emulate their own modes. And uh, there's some problems in GKE quite recently where this was too permissive, and uh, yeah, there are. <coughs> it's a great feature for auto scaling, but it's a bad feature for security. Our back, as we've discussed, is the role based access control. Everything, everything uses the same RBAC mechanism. So the API server has uh, RBAC credentials, or credentials that are mappable to the same RBAC uh, mechanism. The controller manager has about 15 different, because it separates privilege very aggressively, and it is sort of, uh, it's a good reference from that perspective. Um, but this also means that RBAC is very difficult to not only parse mentally without using other tooling, um, but also it's a likely point of escalation, because if you get something slightly wrong, um, even, for example, listing secrets, Although secrets probably relate to something like maybe the private key that you've used to stand up your API server, or maybe you've got some cloud provider secrets in there. So the fact that Kubernetes has basically been built by developers for developers means that a lot of these, a lot of things that you consider maybe bad practice, like putting cluster secrets hosted within the cluster itself, are part of the course in some implementations. Uh, we should always federate off to centralized. To a, to a federated place. Uh, there are plenty of different ways to do that. It just makes sense. This is probably the best name for any flag that's ever been seen. Uh, the insecure port is so called because there is no authentication. Why is that? Because the theory is if I'm on the local host adapter, then I must be trusted on the machine. Well, we know that's not true because, first of all, if I get an RCE, in something running on the machine, and that is a privileged pod, or it has a net, uh, net host, I can get to the loopback adapter. I can issue a 127, uh, uh, a request to 127, because I have that adapter. So if this port is enabled, your cluster is very easily routable. Now, happily, it's mostly off, but that, that really, uh, again, access to this port as admin means you can definitely <coughs> route the cluster. Uh, this is an example of just curling that port, pulling some secrets. Those are the certificate and token um, that are generated for uh, to authenticate as an RBAC user. And uh, yeah, you, you can just enumerate the entire contents of the secrets. Uh, onwards, we have uh, anonymous authentication as well. Leaving this on, it doesn't seem so bad, but it means that you can enumerate public servers. If someone's API server is facing the internet, we can pull the version, and we now want that version to not be 1.10.3, because that is vulnerable to the API server exploits. So just like everything, you would never leave a banner running on a web server. You should never leave this as publicly identifiable information. etcd is the source of truth for the cluster. The API server operates exclusively through it and on communication um, and, uh, and behavior of the cluster operates exclusively through the API server. So you can imagine the whole cluster is stateless with all the state in SCD. It stands to reason that should be segregated and controlled. Um, here in client certificates, 
and there are now options to also encrypt SCD at rest, which there didn't used to be. Uh, and of course, key rotation. Um, when we get into Istio, we'll see that we actually have a cert rotation of one hour by default. Um, most Kubernetes clusters that we see are set with about a year expiry on the, um, on the key the certificate authority. Arguably, you should never have a Kubernetes cluster that is a year old because it advances by a version every three months. And if you're doing blue-green deployments, which I would consider correct operational practice using immutable infrastructure, you wouldn't be upgrading in place either. If you upgrade in place, you've just got another headache. Um, and you also have no, I, I won't belabor the, the blue-green, but I love it dearly. So, with that in mind, uh, thank you, Kat. So, containers form the basis of the Kubernetes security model. And we all know this, I presume, and these mechanisms that are provided by the kernel, because of course containers don't really exist, and they are just a view or a window onto the world provided to the process by the kernel. It only takes a single kernel bug to break out of some of these things, and as such, we should be layering them all, because uh, we've even seen like eBPF breakouts uh, in the last year, capabilities have always had problems, the user namespace is still not really fit for purpose. We're kind of waiting for V2. Um, so, yeah, defense in depth, of course, with everything. And then we move on to pods, the lowest addressable Kubernetes runtime component. This is insecure because it's privileged. And there are lots of other things a pod can do to break the container security model. We went through briefly earlier. Running as root is a bad idea. There are no user namespaces enabled. What that means is that when I have when I'm in a hid namespace, I see myself as PID1, the window on the world the kernel gives me, but the kernel sees me as PID 20,010 and as PID1, because it's aware both of my ID on the host, but also my ID in my namespace, and can make appropriate decisions as you'd expect a kernel too. However, within the namespace, that self-reflective view um, is, is absolute. There's no way, and that's the point of a namespace, there's no way to see what you are without breaking the abstraction. This is applied for memory, for processes, for network, for inter-process communication, various other things. It is not applied for users, and users are the fundament of the Linux security model. Everything's a file, everything is owned by a user. So that means containers are all well and good until you, for example, run a process as root inside a container. Because then your UID zero inside a container, but you're also UID zero <coughs> on the host. Now, it's not as bad as it sounds because layered protections means that actually App Armor and SetComp and capabilities will prevent us from <laughs> doing the things that we may think we, we can do. Um, container runtimes do things like mask proc. So we can't just write stuff straight into and mask sys. So we can't just write things straight into the kernel on the host. Um, they also turn off a huge number of sys calls, so we're still filtered. So the protections are adequate, but they're not really good enough. And as such, dropping to an unprivileged user in a Docker file is minimum viable security for a container. Why is this important? Well, if running is privileged, then we're suddenly saying we're going to turn off all our namespaces. Privilege turns off App Armor, turns off SecCom, turns off all namespaces, and leaves you with something that looks a bit like a PID namespace. That means you can do stuff like attach to the host network adapter, remount the host disks. The cluster is gone, basically. So privilege is probably the most dangerous flag in the history of computing. <laughs> uh, and so to prevent potential attacks, uh, this is a control plane tool. This is basically static analysis for YAML resources. And I would argue that this is the new DevSecOps for Kubernetes. Running static analysis on YAML is just what a pod security policy does. It is just the way to identify whether or not we've got these problems before we hit the cluster. And in the vein of shifting left, running the same pod, uh, the same um, CubeSec rule set against something in development as with an admission controller in production means that you don't have to wait until you've deployed something to find out that it will be rejected by the cluster. Basically, it just does some static analysis and throws you back uh, rationale for why things are bad. Um, and then the uh, actually this companion website has all the reasons for all the rules. Um, this is 
very close to being open sourced as well. We've been running it for about a year and uh, have done a few tweaks. Um, and yeah, that will be out soon. Pod security policies. These are a way of validating the incoming pod. And what they do is they, for example, prevent you from sharing namespaces. They remove some control and agency from the developer and say, we're applying policy to the cluster at this level. They're a bit annoying to implement because of the way they hook back into our back and permissions, but they're actually quite nice once you get used to them. You can apply them at different levels for different people, for different namespaces and different scenarios. Absolutely mandatory. If you don't run this, people can just spin up a privileged pod and do what they want. But they're not quite as detailed. For example, something you can't get <coughs> people doing is, uh, just right here, just at the bottom, uh, is mounting the Docker socket. Why would you want to mount the Docker socket? Well, it's exactly the same thing. If you have a Docker socket mounted inside, for example, a Jenkins build slave that's running on Kubernetes, and somebody gets access to that socket, well, they can then start a container running as privileged, and they can root the host and then they root to the cluster. And that's not always true. You can protect the cluster in some ways. KubeSec, this is a great tool from Gareth Rushgrove, which is based on staff analysis again. Right, <coughs> deployments. <laughs> The very bravest of the brave. Right, so uh, I've said we've come from the Borg world and Borg moved on to Omega, which was essentially the learnings from Omega were wrapped back into Borg, but this is some of the important stuff. So labels particularly, um, Borg had some, I can't remember, but some incomplete way of addressing. With labels, you have infinite permutations, and you can address things however you like. Good thing, actually, probably a bad thing, because labels then become a security primitive. Um, we choose how to route things based on labels. As you'll see later, we choose how to constrain network traffic with network policies with labels. Labels are not validated when you apply them, and they don't have to have a matching target, which kind of makes some sense, because you might want to deploy a service, and then, sorry, you might want to deploy, it does make some sense in some world, yeah, you might want to deploy something that doesn't route to the thing that you're actually spinning up. So you have a deployment and a service run separately, for example, and then you switch a service across to the deployment, and you've got the old deployment that has no labels addressing it. You can do whatever you want, because Kubernetes has no nothing remotely strong. But the whole system is asynchronous and loosely validated, uh, which is great for massive scalability, but appalling from a security perspective. There is... So services from a security perspective are useful because if you want to bind to a port unique 10.24, you need to root, or you need to cap net bind permission. Services allow you to masquerade as a different port. So here we say port 443 is what the service externally presents as, and a service is just a VIP um, masking whatever's behind it as defined by the selector. And then the target port for the back-end service becomes 8443. That means that I can run Nginx bound on a high port as a non-root user, back to that, super important, and masquerades with this VIP on, well, VIP and port combo on port 43. It's a security feature. Um, right, service accounts, these are the things that are inserted by default. Uh, they define a role for every possible actor. They have to be automated, they have to be tested for whitelist and blacklist. Um, otherwise, you have no visibility. Admission controllers, this is how a, uh, an API request comes from kube control or from um, just using the API restfully or whatever that would be. The important thing here, um, after we have our standard auth MMZ, is admission controllers. These things are super cool. They allow us to validate or mutate a request in flight, and if any of the validations fail, or we'll run in parallel, we fail the request. This is where KubeSec hooks in. This is where pod security policies hook in. This is where you could say, for example, if this image does not come from a fully qualified domain register, an FQDM that we trust, we won't allow it into the cluster. You can also hook out into external tools like your image scanning tools to verify that the image has been scanned and has beneath a certain level of criticality uh, or critical vulnerabilities, or that the ones, more realistically, that we have are acceptable. So these are super useful. Um, we have webhooks now, so we can actually extend this in hosted uh, sort of uh, GKE 
EKS scenarios. And I would recommend running all of these. Uh, I mean, yeah, take that as a well. I won't go through these in detail because um, we are already, uh, already going through. But node restriction is super important. This means that a compromised node cannot be used to request credentials for workload that it is not running. So if I've got a three node cluster and I compromise the first node, I can't then use the credentials on that node, the API that the Kubler has to have, everything's our back all the way through. I can't use those credentials to request secrets for a workload running on a different node. That requires not only the admission controller, but also a different um, authorization mode. You would also run our back as another mode in there. Without this, compromise a single Kubler roots cluster, and you can very easily escalate from there. Uh, with this, you've got to work Fair bit harder. Uh, what security policy we spoke about, service accounts can be used to actually turn service accounts off now, happily. Um, and then, yeah. we should always be running compliance against clusters. Um, broadly, uh, most things are running CIS Benchmark or Sonaboy. Um, CIS Benchmark stuff is being updated for 1.11 or 1.13, I think, as we speak. Um, I expect that quite soon. And whatever we do, these will be open source ones. We should be doing some form of image scanning. Now, it should be noted, if you go for an open source image scanner, you will get the open source CVE feeds from the package repository maintainers of your distribution. If that is Alpine, you get a lot less tying together of whether version 1.2 has actually been backported the patch for 1.4, whereas with the traditional operating system vendors like Red Hat, and Debian, and Ubuntu, you actually get a lot more information and reduce false positives. Um, these will just throw more or less everything at you. If you want to understand biostatic analysis, not only the application dependencies, uh, sorry, the operating system dependencies, also the application dependencies, MPM, Maven, PyPy, whatever, then you have to pay, essentially. Um, going for one of the commercial offerings gives you far greater coverage for the workloads and not just for the base images. And of course, they offer further features. Uh, Kubernetes networking is fairly complicated. I mentioned the CNI plugin earlier. Ultimately, whatever networking technology you choose, make sure that you understand the networking before throwing it at Kubernetes, because you'll be required to debug whatever form of networking you've chosen, whatever encapsulation or whatever layer it is you've gone for. Um, suffice to say, there is a lot of encapsulation in container networking, and it is mostly just IP tables. Joy of all joys. Um, these all have network policy <coughs> available. If you use, um, I, I believe at the moment, the EKS default, someone might have to correct me here, does not support network policy, and uh, I'm not quite sure how it will. I think they have to link that back into security groups, but they're doing some super funky stuff by giving every pod its own elastic network adapter. Uh, so consequently, network policy, which is absolutely imperative for any reasonably secure deployment, uh, is currently not supported, as far as I know. Uh, network policies have this very bizarre concept. So this is just going to fail open. It's actually a blob wildcard. Um, kind of makes some sense, because they want it to fail open. Well, <coughs> fail close, actually. Fail, fail really. Um, but it's horrible, I hate that syntax. It's not clearly defining what it does. Here is um, a slightly more useful uh, network policy. It's preventing egress on these ports, denying <coughs> egress. It's still not very clear what this does though, right? Two namespace selects a wildcard. Well, well I'll tell you it's a wildcard, but again, I think it's, it's a very, something so critical, uh, it's a very poor syntax. Um, and it's just for layer three and four traffic because DNS lookup is non-deterministic. It might be GOIP, it might be load balanced, um, it might be random, round robin. So, um, yes, this is impermissible. Uh, and the meat of the rest of this talk of this today will be about how we're going to secure things beyond network policy, beyond traditional layer three and four <coughs> firewalling with uh, essentially TLS and layer seven secure naming. Um, this is an accurate reflection of my life. <laughs> uh, so just, just briefly, this 
what Istio is supposed to be doing. The downstream there is your application. It places a proxy in front of every instance of every application on the mesh and all communication in and out of that network namespace or pod is exclusively proxied through, in this case, the Envoy proxy. Um, why that's important, we'll go into much more detail on shortly. Um, Control Plane have written the tool for testing network policies because it's hell. Um, basically, you describe the DNS names of what you want to white and blacklist, and then this enters the network namespace with Nmap and aggressively parallelizes all requests, gives you some tap output, and you can then validate for your, your network policies are what you expect them to be when you allow people to make pull requests in as your application uh, is maintained, of course. A few more bits and bobs here. I, of, of course, running in containers, we don't need very much on the host. CoreOS pioneered this idea. Uh, it's still going on strong. We don't need to ship stuff on the host. And if we're root on the host, then we can just run something in a container. To, uh, and, and that approach works a lot of the way. It can get a bit annoying when you've got to remount host into a container, and then you've got different paths and blah, blah, blah. But it, it's, it's suitable, it's nice. <laughs> it means you could run some of your host partitions immutable. Of course, you can't really run anything fully immutable because generally applications are writing something somewhere, even if it's only a bit. Um, of course, security extensions, mutable infrastructure is a favorite of mine. It requires front-loaded effort to achieve, but it means you can just tear stuff down willy-nilly and you can be relatively, uh, you, you can enjoy the, the benefits of reverse uptime, where the length of time something has been up is correlated with the likelihood it has to be vulnerable. So instead, if you just make sure that you've, uh, um, you can rotate everything really quickly, including the servers, you're in a much nicer place for incident response and general anti-patching. If you patch everything, just deploy the latest version. And of course, grouping nodes, like there is no silver bullet with containers or with Kubernetes. Traditional network security segregation principles apply. Why would they not? Because developers come along, hey, okay, it's really cool, we can just isolate everything. Absolutely not. Network security is just as important as it ever has been. Preventing an attacker from getting to the network becomes a lot easier, but um, still must do all these things. Metadata APIs, again, it's just it's a no-brainer, but unless you deploy, uh, ideally, Kayam, really good tool from a uh, London company, um, then an RCE in a pod can hit the metadata API for that node. Because that request is going from the pod over the container network interface onto the host speednet adapter, or virtual NIC, and then onto the SDN of AWS, for example, it looks like a request from the node. So instance roles are then given for free to the workloads running in containers. It's, I mean, it's necessarily the way it is. There's no way around it. The way these things fix it is they run as privilege, but that's because they need to IP tables block that outbound packet on the host. Obviously, just not running with instance roles is a much nicer way to do that if your architecture permits it. Oh, that's a shame. There are kittens on this particular video. Oh. Uh, but there we go. I, I <laughs> um, if you just have a Kubernetes cluster where you trust all of your internal development team, for example, then just isolate them by namespace, apply pod security policies, isolate each namespace with a network policy, and use limit ranges to prevent resource exhaustion. Um, of course, never co-tenant, never test, despite the Google infrastructure for everybody else dream of a few years ago. And of course, the supply chain is very important. Compliance is really important as well. Running as little in a base image as possible, strongly recommended. Um, from scratch means you start off with nothing in your container file system, which is just parvel, and then as you build up what that extracts into, you can just stick in the very minimum. Like maybe you need local time or some stuff for locale. And then finally, uh, not quite finally, everything's code. GitOps is super cool. Um, we can touch on it later. It's basically configuration as code for applications. If you don't trust the different tenants in your cluster, then, or, or yeah, running code, um, they shouldn't be on the same cluster. The, the ease of getting from a compromised pod to a compromised cluster is, is far too low. 
to uh, really be, to let us sleep safely at night, let's say. So what should we do? Well, what would you normally do? You'd spin up two different address <coughs> accounts, you would hear just what you need to hear between them, and you completely separate them. Exactly the same for Kubernetes. There's no silver bullet. It's not some magical network security um, uh, bullet, I suppose. Um, you can go some of the way by separating node pools and labeling things so that they segregate nicely. You need to put admission controllers and uh, your own static analysis in place to make sure that teams are not deploying onto other people's node pools because you can't actually prevent that unless you alter the YAML that they're running. Yes, yeah, so you can do a few other things. I mean, ultimately, it's just depends on depth. Uh, Dan Walsh is the Red Hat container guy. He said this years ago, and it's all still true. Docker is about running random crap from the internet as root on your host. <laughs> Super nice. Um, rootless containers are coming. Uh, I won't go into those right now, but Run C runs rootless. There's a project called User Netties, which runs in a user namespace. Uh, and the guys building those are like kernel and container runtime maintainers. So it's really deep. Um, I hope it'll be adopted soon. And then, of course, uh, continuously securing things is a matter of placing a cat close to them. This is DevSecOps in a nutshell, right? We're writing tests for behavior. That the side effects of those tests failing are security holes. It's that simple. Use a lot of the same tooling. Maybe we focus more on things like encryption at the network level or testing for access and privileges or things. But we're making assertions against cluster states or against, in fact, just Linux configuration. That we expect to be there. It's all the same. You can do the same thing with Kubernetes. Um, yeah, I leave my preaching to the choir on this slide. So don't get caught out. Be proactive and preempt what's coming. Like so, <laughs> and uh, yes, that is the conclusion of the first part. Thank you very much.